Okay, let's go ahead and get our meeting started. And I'm going to ask JT if he'd come up here and lead us in prayer. And then uh, we'll ask uh, uh, retired Captain David Swafford, United States military, uh, Navy, retired. I don't ever want to say Army, do I, David? Yeah. And uh, we'll ask him to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So at this point in time, JT. Go about your heads with me, please. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you are an awesome God. You never cease to amaze me with the abilities that you have. Father, we come today uh, from different walks of life, and we come today with well, the common purpose and common goals and common desires. We all love you. That's most important. Father, we all come also with concerns for our nation, concerns for our country, concerns for our state, concerns for our cities. We ask, Father, for your wisdom and discernment as this is an election year. Father, we pray that godly men and women are elected, and not only are they elected, that they maintain their godliness and not give in to, well, power. Because that old saying, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. We pray that you protect it with a hedge of protection. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray for this meeting. We thank you, Father, that Avi's here that he's had a safe trip here and he's, he's traveling. May your anointing be upon him. Father, we also pray for those who, for the food, that it might nourish and strengthen our bodies, that we might too nourish you. What a great God you are. We humble ourselves in your presence. We thank you for our Savior, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen. 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 very much and uh, we got more people coming in here okay well, we're going to get on with our meeting now and uh, I'm very happy to have uh, Avi Lipkin I used to listen to Avi on point of view with Marlon Maddox that's where I first came across him and then in 2001 I had the morning drive show on KREF uh, 1400 a.m. out of Norman and I was um, able to get Avi to come on the program. Now, it was a telephone interview from New York City. It was kind of funny. I called this number, which I, I just had a number for him. I didn't know it was his, I won't even go into it. But he answers the phone and I says, is this Avi Lipkin? He said, who is this and how'd you get this number? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a reason for that, folks. And uh, But uh, I, I knew two people here that knew him and one person knew him very well and that's how I got that number so I called him up and asked him to be on my radio program and he was very gracious to do that I think I had time to ask him one question and from that point on it was like taking a drink out of a fire hydrant because uh, he had a few things he wanted to share and I've never seen him to be a man that lack words. <laughs> but his words are well worth listening to. Please welcome Avi Lipkin. Good to see you. Okay. Time is aimed on me. And uh, even though I'm Jewish, I'm living proof that ham is kosher. <laughs> yes, I always ham it up. <laughs> okay, enough levity. Uh, and I'm very appreciative uh, when I'm invited to this forum and to any church or any other forum that invites me because, uh, you know, when you have a criminal sentence, I'm a criminal. And I appreciate very much the opportunity to speak. Now, why am I a criminal? Switzerland, yes. And uh, what happened was that the Christian uh, EDU party invited me to come to Switzerland uh, to try to help and save Switzerland from the Muslims. Now, Switzerland is a small country. The Muslims have 400 mosques. Uh, and most of their mosques are like in non-discreet industrial buildings. And they don't have like these fantastic mosques that are being built here in America. Uh, and they decided we want to start adding to the buildings, we want to add minarets. Okay, now minarets are these tall spires 
and they have loud uh, broadcasters five times a day, uh, starting at 4.30 in the morning. So if you live within two or three miles of these minarets, you're going to be awakened at 4.30 in the morning with Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Now, how many people know what Allah Akbar means? What does it mean, Pastor? It means God is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. Correction. Allah is greater. Allah is greater than the other God. Who's the other God? Everybody else. Our God. The God. By the way, are there any atheists here? Are there any people who don't believe in God? Atheists, apostates, New Agers? No, because if there are, then I have another way of talking which will convince you also. But if we are all believers in God and in the Bible, who said he was greater than God before his fall? They proclaim the superiority of their God over our God. And I know that uh, Oklahoma is probably the reddest state in the Union, praise God. But you do have a problem even in this state with the imposition of Sharia law. Sharia law is going to push for mosques and minarets. And when I was in Switzerland, I said, you know, I said to the Swiss, you guys, you Europeans, are forgetting your history. I mean, the Americans never learned the history, but the Europeans had a history, and they're forgetting their history. What was the history? <laughs> that the Arabs invaded Spain, Portugal, and France in the year 711. By 732, they had basically bypassed Switzerland, and they were already in North France and Belgium. They had this Battle of Tours, 732, Roland, Charlemagne, they beat back the Muslims, and it takes 760 years more till they push them out of Spain and Portugal as well. As the Muslims were being pushed out of Spain and Portugal in 1492, the Turks were moving in from the east, also Muslims. The Turks had surrounded Vienna, and the Turks were strangling Vienna over a period of 200 years. Can you imagine an enemy outside of Washington, 200 years threatening Washington? But the Europeans had it in all of Eastern Europe. And I, so I said to the Swiss, you know, you guys know your history. You know it was to the west in France. You know it was to the east in Austria, right next door. And here you are, you Swiss, you got a white cross on a red ensign. And if you want to let them have mosques and minarets and let them take over your country, take out the white cross from your red flag and put in a, a white moon crescent and a star. You got the Turkish flag. And the Turks, supported by President Obama, want to join the European Union. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. I want to finish the Swiss story. I've preached in over a thousand churches all over the world. I've been in over a thousand radio and TV shows. <laughs> And in Switzerland, I got up and I said, Allah is not God. Allah is Satan, Lucifer, the devil. And I said, Islam is not a religion. Islam is a criminal psychosis worse than Nazism. Because the Nazis wanted to kill only the Jews. Islam wants to kill the Jews on Saturday, and the Christians on Sunday, and the Hindus, and the Buddhists, and the blacks any day. And then when they finish killing everyone else, they kill each other. In the name of Allah. I mean, is God schizophrenic? Does God love the Jews, or does he hate the Jews? He loves the Jews. Zachari I learned this from the Christians, Zechariah 2, verse 12. The Jews are the apple of God's eye. And anyone who touches the Jews touches the apple of God's eye. You don't want to touch the apple of God's eye. Does God love the Christians? Yes. yes. Romans 9 to 11, the Christians are grafted into the Jews. Would God have grafted the Christians into the Jews if he hated either one of them? Does God love the sinner? Yes. Yes. Love the sinner, hate the sin. He loves the Hindus, he loves the Buddhists, he loves the Muslims. They're all pagans, but they're in his image. Does God seek the death of any of his children? God seeks the repentance of his children. So I think it's fair to say that God loves every human being on the face of the earth. And God does not seek the death, God seeks the life. And Allah, who's Allah? Allah is the moon god, the war god, and the sword god, pagan god of ancient Mecca Medina. He hates the Jews, wants them dead on Saturday. Hates the Christians, wants them dead on Sunday. Hates the Hindus, hates the Buddhists, hates the blacks in Africa, and then the Muslims kill each other, like in Syria. 
By the way, who's the good guy in Syria today? Does anyone know? There are no good guys. And if you want, oh no, the, the Christians are good guys, they're a minority, and so they're allied with Bashar al-Assad. Who does your president, President Obama support? The Muslim Brotherhood. His brothers. And his brothers. And he supports the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which is going to kill, convert, or expel 10 million Coptic Christians in Egypt. As Americans, you, we, I, I'm still an American, I still have my American passport here. America is supporting today the annihilation of 15 million Christians in the Middle East. America is supporting the Holocaust by supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. And I think I've said this many times. In the Middle East, Jew, Christian, Muslim all know that Obama is a Muslim. The only people on the face of the earth that do not know that Obama is a Muslim are the American people. Because it's not politically correct to talk about it. Some of the American people. Some of the Americans. Well, obviously, I mean, the people who should be hearing me are not here to this, morning, this afternoon. <laughs> so praise God, November the 29th, 2009, the Swiss had a national vote, a national referendum, and 57.5% of the Swiss people voted down the minarets. Praise God. Amen. And there are no minarets in Switzerland today. But I want you to know, it's here in America. The Muslims want minarets in America because wherever they have a minaret broadcasting at 4.30 in the morning, Allah Akbar, they are promoting, they are, they are praising the triumph of Allah, the war god, the moon god, the sword god, over the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is the destruction of the United States of America. You know, there's a place in Wisconsin, how many people heard of Sheboygan? Sheboygan, it's a very pretty famous town. And the liberal Christians and the liberal Jews allowed them to put up minarets. You know, freedom of religion. It's part of their religion. Let them have minarets. So now all the Jews and Christians, within a radius of two, three miles, are all selling their homes and moving away because of the noise pollution. But it's not just noise pollution. And it's not just Sheboygan. And it's in Dearborn, and it's in Los Angeles, and it's in Brooklyn, and it's in Col all kinds of places in the U.S. And wherever they go, they establish around that a cancer, a ghetto. So anyway, thank you for having me, because after I spoke in Switzerland, the Muslims took me to court for hate speech against another religion, and I was convicted, and the EU paid a fine, so it was commuted, but I'm on probation for 10 years. I really don't want to go to Switzerland. <laughs> But I did have some role in the Christian victory in Switzerland, praise God. Not just the Christian victory, the victory of Judeo-Christian Western civilization and democracy in Switzerland. And so here, yes, it's a battle between cultures, or shall I say between culture and anti-culture. Okay. What I wanted to say now is something that nobody, Jew or Christian, dares to say. America today, uh, is a country of about 307, 308 million people. Uh, you have a question regarding 12 million illegal Mexicans. And let me first say that I believe that immigration is good for America. Immigration helps to build the economy. It does have a very positive aspect to it. And I think that most of these Hispanic people should be quickly processed and given citizenship. Having said that, okay, having said that, <laughs> let, let me go where I'm going because this is going to lead to the next thing. In 1979, the Jews in America were the number two. Christians were number one, Jews were number two. And I was part of that. I was you know, one of the Jews, six million Jews out of 250 million, something like that. And then you had a president, I think, perhaps until recently the most stupidest of all the presidents, <laughs> Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter brought down your best friend and your best ally in the Middle East, in the Muslim world, Shah of Iran. You know, because Jimmy Carter didn't like dictators. Dictators are not good people. They're guilty of human rights violations. And Jimmy Carter said, there is this man of God. We're going to bring him in. And he's going to replace the Shah, and he's going to unite the people, and he's a Democrat, and his name is Ayatollah Khomeini. Yeah. Because he said, I'm a Southern Baptist, and he's a man who believes in God. We both believe in God. Do you understand why I started with who is Allah? Yeah. If you serve God, and you see someone who serves the devil, 
Are you both serving God? No. So the first problem in the United States is there is no one defining who Allah really is. You cannot cure a disease until you diagnose it. So the solution for America is God. The sickness is Satan. That's my message. <clears throat> the Shah of Iran was a great ally. He was an ally of Israel also. He was the cornerstone of the Cold War against the Soviet Union, the evil empire. You know, the Iranians already had a nuclear project under the Shah. It was started by the United States and by Israel. Because the Iran was your ally. And Jimmy Carter single-handedly created a situation in which we are now facing nuclear war, World War III, because of the stupidity of Jimmy Carter, who thought that Ayatollah Khomeini served the same God as he serves. And you want to know something? Nothing has changed in this country. The media won't touch it. A lot of churches don't want to touch it. The Jews won't touch it. Because the Jews don't believe in the existence of a Satan loser for the devil. And I get attacked in Israel for saying, oh, this obviously is a, a Christian because he believes that there's a devil. We Jews don't believe. If the Christians believe there's a devil, obviously there's no devil. That's the Jewish approach in Israel. And if the Christians say the world is round, we Jews will say the world is flat. I don't know if you can understand what I'm dealing with. I'm working to form a Judeo-Christian political party in Israel to run for the Knesset. And God willing, it's going to happen very soon. How much time do I have? Because I can rant and rant for hours. But 30, 30 more minutes. 30 more minutes. I, I, we're good. When the Shah of Iran was stabbed in the back by the president, uh, Democratic President Jimmy Carter, 9 million Iranians out of 70 million had to flee immediately or be beheaded by the fanatic Muslim leadership. Does anyone know where the vast majority of the 9 million Iranian Shiites went? America. America. So if you got 9 million, 8 million, 7 million, and the Jews are only 6 million, who's number two in America? The Muslims. What did Obama say in his first inaugural address in January 2009? He said, America today is a Christian, Muslim, comma, Jewish, Hindu country. Jews are no longer number two. And this is no longer a Judeo-Christian country. This is a Christian, Muslim country. Isn't that wonderful? One nation under God and Satan. Do you understand why it's so critical to, to, to define who is Allah? Is Allah God or is he, not, is he not God? And you know there are churches. How many people have heard of Chrislam? Churches that pray together with the Muslims to Allah. That's called synagogues of Satan. Okay. That's, that's widespread. Yeah, it's very widespread. The problem here is ignorance. And I don't know what churches you belong to, but it's very important for the pastors to teach what is Islam, the real Islam. What is Satan, the real Satan? And Satan is not some kind of a wimp. Satan is, a, is a, an evil agent that has one and a half billion people following him. Okay, so you got, I don't know, seven, eight, nine million Iranian Shiite Muslims. The Arab Immigrant Association, they're not Shiite Iranians, they are Arab Sunnis. They claim 7 million in America. How much is 7 million and 9 million? 16, 16 million. You all heard of Louis Farrakhan? Yeah. Nation of Islam claims 4 million. That's 20 million. And I think I've mentioned this in the past in these meetings. There is an unbelievable illegal influx of Muslims into the United States of America. How many people know that? How many people saw the email from last week about this flyer, this pilot, he flies for a private charter company that works for the U.S. government, and they're flying in charter flights every day into the U.S. of Muslims. And they don't go through passport control. They take them to the end of the runway, a bus goes out there, picks them up, or a few buses, they give each one $3,000, and then send them on their way. You know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Maine, I was once flying out of DFW. I returned my rental car. Very handsome, very nice Indonesian gentleman. And I say gentleman. And uh, I'm in a rush to catch my flight. He doesn't know me, I don't know him. And he says, America is the greatest country on the face of the earth. And I said, yeah, I know. Why do you think America is the greatest country on the earth? Well, I'm a Muslim from Indonesia. 
And I used to work for a delivery company like FedEx UPS. And once I was delivering packages to the U.S. Embassy in Jakarta, and uh, an American embassy official pointed his finger at me and said, Hey, you! You want to go to America? There's a plane leaving tomorrow. Bring your family. Bring your friends. This is a one-time opportunity. No passports, no visas, nothing. Just get to the airport and you're in America and you'll be processed in America. Isn't America the greatest country on earth? You know, I have a... On and off, I have vehicles I rent, I buy. I have a new, God provided a new vehicle for me with a six-year loan. <laughs> and I travel a lot on the 35, I-35, I-44 corridor. And I always stop at mile marker number four in Missouri. As soon as I cross into Missouri, I stop at mile marker four where we have all these truck stops. I got these three girlfriends in uh, Joplin. They're 70, 75 years old. And they work for these truck, they still work for these trucking companies. And they say to you, every day there are two buses coming up from the Mexican border through Texas carrying Muslims up to the northern states. No passports. I don't know how they're coming into the country. Your gatekeepers in Washington and your gatekeepers in the border are bribed by the Saudis. You know, I, this may sound completely crazy. Everything I'm saying sounds crazy. My wife, Rachel, is an Egyptian-born Jewish woman. She left Egypt, or shall I say, she was expelled from Egypt at age 20. Arabic is her mother tongue. And so Rachel works as an intelligence gatherer for the Israeli government. The Israeli radio services. She monitors their radio, their TV, their newspapers, computer reports. And 30 years ago, Rachel would pick up broadcasts from the Saudis. Listen carefully. It sounds like complete madness. For my wife, it was complete madness 30 years ago. The Saudis were saying, even if it takes us 150 years, we're going to make America a Muslim country. And my wife said, America is the greatest Christian country on earth. How can it be a Muslim country? 30 years later, my wife and I are both 65. Do you know what my wife is picking up now? The Saudis are saying, we were wrong. It's not going to take 150. It's going to take 30 years. And America will be a Muslim country. Can you believe America will be a Muslim country? So in addition to the 20 million, how many people heard of the Somalis? you got hundreds of thousands of Somalis in this country. You've got hundreds of thousands of Bosnians. You even have Russian Chechens who blow up the, the bomb there in Boston. The Russians warned America. Nobody paid attention. You've got Muslims coming up from Venezuela. They go to Venezuela, the Shiites control there, and then they come up through the underbelly of the United States, Central America, through Mexico, and they come across. I have to tell you another I, I, My whole life, stories that I pick up. I spoke at a Baptist church in uh, Laredo on the border of Mexico. It's called United Baptist Church. And uh, I speak Spanish as a mother tongue. So I preach in Spanish, I preach in English. And I preach to the English and Spanish services at the church. And then afterwards we went out to dinner and the pastor says to me, you know, I have to tell you a little story. One day we came to church at eight in the morning and we opened up the church and we found this woman, a darker olive skinned woman, prostrate in front of the altar wet from the waist down. So we spoke to her in Spanish. She didn't speak Spanish. She was from Iran. What's her story? She became a believer. Christ revealed himself to her in Iran. She wasn't married, but she was from a very aristocratic family, very well-to-do, very rich family. And the Muslim said, we're going to kill you unless you re recant. How many people know a lot of people are coming to Christ in Iran? I mean, thanks to the Khomeini regime, a lot of Christians, Muslims are private Christians. So when they said they're going to kill her, because she was not married, she does not need permission from her husband. She had a passport. She bought a ticket to Paris, France. She flew from Iran to Paris. Then she bought a ticket from Paris to Mexico City. She landed in Mexico City. She hired a taxi. How many people know the word coyote? Coyote. Coyotes are the Im illegal immigrant runners. Yeah. He said, take 16-hour drive from Mexico City up to the Laredo border. 
They got there about two in the morning, two in the morning, middle of the night. He said, there it is, the Rio Grande River. You just go down the embankment, wade across and go up the embankment, and that's what she did. And about, I don't know, 10 blocks away was the, the, the church. That was the first building that she saw that was, had lights on, was open. She went in, the door was open. And so she was thanking God. You know, she was prostrate on the ground, thanking God that she made it to America. And so the pastor said, you got to surrender to the police. We will vouch for you. No, no, she, she got citizenship. She got uh, asylum. You see, I'm a nobody. I'm not one of those Israeli speakers who gets $5,000 for a, a, a speech. So for me to get a gig, excuse the expression, I have to go down to Brownsville, Texas, and Laredo, and I have to go up to the Canadian border. They're coming in from the Canadian border. You cannot close the Canadian border. It's easy to get across the border. It's easy, not so easy, but it's easy to get across the Mexican border too. America will be the greatest Muslim country on the face of the earth very soon unless you guys wake up and do something about it. And I, forgive me for saying it, it has nothing to do with Republicans or Democrats. Because the people who are in control in Washington, the Saudis know who they are. And the Saudis bribe them. The Saudis bribe their equal opportunity bribers. The bottom line is America must be a Muslim country. And I think it's very interesting that states like Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, which run straight through like a spinal cord of the United States of America, they're the true patriotic states. And so I say it's, a lot of this is up to you guys. And I'm going to say something now, which is even scarier, but it's my job to warn you. If you've got 20 to 30 million Muslims in America and only 6 million Jews, and the Muslims have as part of their religion, remember I said it's not a religion, it's criminal psychosis, to kill every Jew on Saturday and to kill the Christians on Sunday. <coughs> and I have a testimony in my books about Edmonton, Canada, called the Edmonton Revelation, where the Muslims of Edmonton have gone on record as saying that they're going to kill the Jews of Edmonton. The Muslims of Toronto will kill the Jews of Toronto. The Muslims of Vancouver will kill the Jews. Now, there's a little problem here because Christians are Jews. In the eyes of Islam, the Jews and the Christians are one people. We are called the people of the book. Ahel el Kitab. The only difference is Saturday, Sunday. And the Jews are intermarried with the Christians, 71%. How many people know that out of every 10 Jews in America, seven are going to marry Christians? You know or you don't know? I mean, this is the simple demographic facts. So if they kill the Jew, they have to kill the Christian spouse. They have to kill the children of the Judeo-Christian couple. And the Canadian police in Edmonton said that they believe that only 10% of the Muslims are terrorists. How much is 10% of 20 million? Two million. How many Jews are there? Six million. And the Muslims have promised that the next attack on the United States will make 9-11 shrivel and pale in comparison. They have a plan for America. It'll be also 9-11 attacks, and it'll be massive killing of Jews and Christians, and your law enforcement will not be able to protect the Jews or their Christian spouses, which will unleash a major wave of immigration to Israel. Do you understand now why I'm forming a Judeo-Christian American style, American values, political party in Israel. This is a revolution. God is preparing a giant spatula to scrape up the Jews and their Christian spouses and send them back to Jerusalem. Now, I want to get back to Obama. Obama supports the Muslim Brotherhood. In Egypt, this is just one example, but this applies to the whole Middle East. Egypt is a country of 80 million Muslims, 10 million Coptic Christians. The 10 million Coptic Christians control the economy of Egypt. You get rid of the Christians, what happens to the economy? You get rid of the economy. The Christians are the backbone of the Egyptian economy. So the Christians either convert to Islam, or they are exiled, or they are killed. This is the plan of Islam. It's been going on for centuries, but it's getting worse and worse. So. What happens to the 80 million Muslims when the Egyptian economy collapses? They starve. What happens when they starve? They leave. Where do they go? America. Okay, now how many people 
have heard of Agenda 21. Okay? Now, Agenda 21 is some kind of a Greek mythology on Mount Olympus ideology. Nobody believes it. Nobody thinks this will ever happen. I'm going to give you my perspective on Agenda 28. You know, I love Oklahoma. I love Texas. And I'm all the time either on 35 or on 75, you know, from Dallas going northeast. You go over the Red River into Oklahoma, and you go about half an hour driving, you don't see a person. It's empty. You got forests, you got lakes, beautiful, some of the most beautiful countryside in the world between the Red River and the, I think, uh, what's the first town? McAllister? Is that the first town? You could fit five, ten million Muslims there. How many people have heard of the King Ranch in Texas? That's the size of Connecticut. Or Rhode Island, excuse me. You could fit five million Muslims there. I don't know if you're beginning to hit my gist. The United States is empty. The United States has room for 10, 20, 50 million, 100 million immigrants. How many people heard of NAFTA? What is the idea of NAFTA? The NAFTA idea is Mexico, Canada, US is half a billion people. Europe, European Union, is 350 million people. So if you have economically a unit of Mexico, US, and Canada, you outnumber the Europeans. It's very important for marketing, for economics. I'm not talking about religious values or the political values, you know. Why do the Turks, why do the Europeans want the Turks to come in? See, because the Turks are 70 million Muslims. If 70 million Muslims join the European Union, they go from 350 to 420. But it's not what you think it is. You see, because the six former Soviet republics that broke away, remember Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, that's 200 million Turkic Muslims. And they are all entitled to Turkish passports. <coughs> Turkey considers the six former republics of the Soviet Union as an integral part of Turkey, modern Turkey today. If you go to Turkey, if you go to Istanbul or Ankara, you go to the schools, you go to the government buildings. All those countries are marked in red. Ottoman Turkey, Ottoman Turkey includes Bosnia, Albania, the Balkans, all the way to the gates of Vienna. Any land that was taken over by Islam over the last 1400 years must return to Islam. The six republics of the Soviet Union do you know why the Soviet Union collapsed? I'm giving you another angle. Because the population of the Soviet Union was 350 million people. 350 million people of which 200 million are Muslim. The Soviet Union was a Muslim country. And so the Russian Orthodox Church said, we, sh we should get rid of these six republics. So today Russia, the Federation, is no longer 350 million, it's only 150, 150 million, mostly Christian, for now. Very soon, 50% of the soldiers in the Russian army are going to be Muslims. Because the Jews and the Christians have one child per family, the Muslims have 10. And the military is always a tool of social mobility in any country. So Muslim families with 10 kids, they send their kids to the army, Russian army. So even today, Russia very soon will have a Muslim Christian parody in its military, which means a generation or two later, whatever is left of Russia will still become Muslim. And so if Turkey joins the European Union, you're talking about 70 million plus 200 million, how much is that, 270 million, all becoming European citizens, even though the Turkish republics go all the way to China in Asia. So the population of this new European Union would not be 350, it would be 620 million people. Do you understand why the US, I say quote, quote unquote, must join with Mexico and Canada? But you're still short. You're 500 million versus 650 million. 500 million, 650 million. So how do you, you gotta equal it off? How do you equal it off? You bring in a hundred million Muslims from Egypt and Syria and all these countries to the U.S. And I want you to know it's good for the economy. Because the Saudis are going to finance the building of homes for 50 million Muslims. 
When you have a housing boom, the whole economy takes off. Mr. Obama is going to be credited with Wall Street going up to 20,000 very soon. As these Muslims pour into the country, and as the Saudi money pours into the country. I mean, that's terrific. You know, the dollar is going to be strong. American economy is going to be the strongest economy in the world. And your population is going to go up with the, with the Canadians and with the Mexicans and Latin Americans. You're going to go up to 600, 650 million people. So you'll be equal with Europe. But America has to forego its Christianity for this to happen. Because Christianity, like Judaism, is an unfortunate stick in the mud for the people who control the money. I mean, either serve the Lord or you serve mammon, right? Who controls Washington? Is it the people who serve the Lord or the people who serve mammon? And they're all bribed by the Saudis. Do you understand the message? And so my message for all, when I say conservatives, OPEC is conservatives, maybe an occasional Jew, was also conservative. But the values that made America great were those Christian, biblical, godly values. And the people today who are in control, forgive me for saying it in Washington, are not Christians. Sometimes you have some isolated Christians who get up and say wonderful things, but the people who really control the country, the people who control the economy, are not Christians. Their Lord is mammon. Yeah. And for that reason, they will attempt to sacrifice Israel for peace with the Palestinians. How many people here think there's going to be a Palestinian state? Never going to be a Palestinian state. And I want to conclude, because I know my time is almost up. I think I've told this joke here before, but I'm going to say it again. What is the difference between neurotic people and psychotic people? How many people have heard the joke? Okay, one hand, so i got to tell them. <laughs> Neurotic people dream about castles in the air. Psychotic people live in castles in the air. And psychiatrists collect the rent. <laughs> now, now you, all, you all heard of Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was psychotic for many reasons. He was living in castles in the air. Why? Two reasons. I'll give you, there are many I'll give to you. Number one, he thought he could conquer the earth. Number two, he thought he could kill all the Jews. Now, can anyone conquer the earth? My phone, sorry. Okay, Adolf Hitler thought he could conquer the earth. Can anyone conquer the earth? The Persians tried it, the Greeks, the Romans, the Mongols. Napoleon, Hitler, Stalin, they all thought they could conquer the earth, they were all crazy. And tens of millions of people died. Only the Lord has dominion over the earth. That's psychosis number one. Psychosis number two, he thought he could kill all the Jews. Can you kill all the Jews? Okay, now there are two types of human beings. There are believers and there are non-believers. The world's very simply divided into two. If you're a believer, meaning a Jew or Christian who believes in God and the Bible, then Jeremiah 31, 35 is just... No, no, that's not, that's not Jeremiah. Now they're going to hear a speech. Oh, it's my son. I'm giving a speech, I run you. So you can listen if you want. <laughs> so this is my son, Aaron, on Skype. My son is the CEO of Lipkin Tours, and uh, his business is growing unbelievably. And I just have to tell you, last year, uh, the year before, we had 3.2 million tourists in Israel. This year, we had 5.2 million tourists. Yay. And uh, you will see very soon a very, very steep increase in the growth of tourism to Israel, especially of Christian pilgrims. Anyway, Jeremiah 31, 35. I think we can all agree that this is a book which is holy to everyone, Jew and Christian. God says, paraphrased, he says, there will be no more Jews on the earth when the moon, the sun, and the stars stop shining. Mm -hmm. You know what that means? Never. It means never. There will always be Jews on, that's God's word. So can you kill all the Jews? No. But, Four billion people, two-thirds of the human race, they don't, they're pagans. Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, great people. But they don't believe in God or the Bible. But everyone knows that the Jews have been scattered to the four corners of the earth. If you cannot conquer the earth, you cannot reach the Jews. So psychosis number one leads to psychosis number two. What does Islam believe? Psychosis number one is going to conquer the earth. Psychosis number two is going to kill all the Jews, which makes Islam just as psychotic as Nazism. But it's worse. 
Psychosis number three, the Muslims are going to kill or convert two billion Christians. Psychosis number four, they're going to kill or convert one million Hindus in India. Psychosis number five, they're going to kill two billion Buddhists, including communist China. Now, I recommend to the Muslims, don't mess with the communist Chinese. They know what to do. They don't have the ACLU. <laughs> Psychosis number six, psycho, psychosis number six is that one sixth of the human race, the Muslims, can annihilate five sixths of the human race and get away with it. Psychosis number seven, the Muslims, after they kill everyone else, what do they do to each other? They kill each other, as we see in Syria and other countries. And psychosis number eight, when you die for Allah, you get 72 virgins. Now you told me that's not a psychosis. I can't manage with one wife. I don't know how they marry four. Seventy-two virgins would be hell. And I just wanted to share one, two more things, and one joke and one more thing. You know, Osama bin Laden dies for Allah. And he goes up to heaven, and he's there. It's a joke. He goes up to heaven, and he's waiting for 72 virgins. And who shows up? George Washington. Six feet tall, beats him up. Patrick Henry shows up, give me liberty, give me death, beats him up. President Adams shows up, beats him up. And the whole line forms of 70 tall, strapping six footers to beat him up. So he goes to Allah's office and demands an explanation. He says, You promised me 72 virgins. And Allah said, No, silly, you weren't listening. I said, 72 Virginians. <laughs> Two more quick things. I just came from the National Religious Broadcasters, and uh, and how many people heard here of Lori Cardoza Moore? Lori Cardoza Moore is a Christian woman. Her husband Stan is a TV video producer, and they just came out with this movie, Israel Indivisible, and it's a movie made by Christians about why Israel should not be cut up and turned into a Palestinian state. And I was there, came from Nashville yesterday, very impressive movie, I have one copy, I don't know if I can leave it for a pastor or maybe with Pastor Glenn Howard. It's about one minute, one hour and eight minutes. The reason they're doing this is because the US government wants to cut Israel up and get, create a Palestinian state whose leadership is psychotic. Can you do business with psychotic people? Can you go to some insane asylum and negotiate a multi-billion dollar deal? And you know what the Palestinians, they don't want to stay. They just want to kill the Jews on Saturday and the Christians on Sunday. Yeah. And they want to terminate America as a Christian country and make it Muslim. And Israel and America are the two only countries on the face of the earth that are founded and created and dedicated to God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes. So that's in this movie. And now, now that I've gotten you all depressed, <laughs> I want to give you, I think it's a prophecy maybe, but I think it's not a prophecy, I think it's just natural domino effect. And it's in my sixth book. My sixth book is called Return to Mecca. And I explain the following, and this is very important to understand. Your great ally, Saudi Arabia, is about to collapse. Let me explain. The Saudis, if you're a Saudi kid, you grow up in the Saudi school system, the Wahhabi school system, and you're taught to kill the Jews on Saturday and the Christians on Sunday. As soon as you graduate high school and you're all on fire, you know, Christians send their kids out to be missionaries. So the Muslims send their kids out to be jihadis to kill. And they give them all this money and say, you go out and you do your jihad in Afghanistan and in Pakistan and in Syria and all these countries. But don't do your jihad in Saudi Arabia. Just do it with the others. But what happens after 5, 10, 15 years? These jihadis are veterans. They've had enough. They want to go home. They want to get married. They want to have children. They come home, Saudi Arabia. You got 40% unemployment. The Saudi king and the royal family of 6,000 princes poured all the wealth to themselves. Most Saudis are destitute, unemployed. The situation is very, very unhappy for the Saudi population, of which many are Shiites, and the Shiites don't have anything. So you have a lot of disgruntled people. And then these jihadis come home and say, you know what, this king sent us off to jihad, and he's the most corrupt guy on the earth. You know why he's corrupt? Because he's a collaborator with the Christian West. The Saudis sell the, you their oil, and then you pay them 
They have nothing to do with the money. What do they do? They reinvest their money in the U.S. It's a symbiotic relationship. It's just the Saudis think they're going to take over America. And so these jihadis are going to kill the king of Saudi Arabia. They're going to start a civil war. The, the Saudi royal family is going to be decimated from within. There's going to be, so there are going to be those who are with the jihadis and those who are against. Islam is a system of division. Now, I know some of you people here just love the one world government. <laughs> and what's going to happen is they're going to say, you know, the way to defeat Christianity is to blow up the oil wells. You blow up the oil wells, you bring down the world economy. Why do the Christians control the Muslims? Because the Christians have the economy, the Muslims have camel dung <laughs> and oil. The way, the great equalizer is collapse the world economy. To collapse the world economy, all you need is two weeks of no oil supplies. No oil, no credit cards, no plastic, no plastic. The whole world economy collapses if there's no oil. It's not just gasoline in your car. And so Big Brother, One World Government, is going to say, no way, Jose. And we're going to take Saudi Arabia, and we're going to take the Persian Gulf, and we're going to take Iran and cut out all this nonsense of jihad, and we're going to impose a one world government, a one world order. We're going to divide Saudi Arabia up. And, now this is just Avi Lipton. There's no one else in the world who's saying this, as far as I know. I would think it's a logical thing for the one world government. Islam is a failure. It is politically and economically corrupt and bankrupt. And we're not going to tolerate the collapse of the one world government anymore. We're going to stop this nonsense of Islam. I, this is what I think is going to happen. They're going to impose a one world order on Saudi. And uh, like Germany in 1945, Saudi will be cut up into districts because it's too big for one country. The Russians will have their share. I'm sure the Russians will be happy with that. The Chinese will have their share. India will have its share. The Europeans will have the share. America will have its share. Unless President Obama says, you know, we don't want to know about it. We're into isolationism then really America loses its preeminence. And they're going to say to Israel, you're right there. Israel's a power. You take North, West, and Saudi. And there are oil wells on that coast between Israel and Mecca. And they're going to say to Israel, you can have that oil. You just got to conquer it. It could be the king of Saudi Arabia will say to the Israelis, come and save us. And so what's going to happen, I believe, when Israel, when Israel takes, why did everyone call me one of them? Odre Bashar Shema. So anyway, so when the Americans and the West uh, intervene and take Saudi Arabia, it's going to be um, a very interesting time because the Israelis take Mecca and Medina. Mecca and Medina are the holy cities of Islam. Can you imagine the uproar in the Muslim countries when the Jews take Mecca and Medina? <laughs> one and a half billion Muslims are going to march on Israel. And when one and a half billion Muslims march on Israel, there's no way to stop that. It's Armageddon. And so what has to happen is, I believe that black stone in Mecca, the Kaaba, that they go around in circles, I cover this in my yellow book. This black stone will not be nuked. How many people heard of Tom Tancredo, yeah. the representative from Colorado? Yeah. After 9-11, he said, one more 9-11 attack, and we nuke Mecca. Now, I am not talking about nuking Mecca, because you've got two, three million people there. You don't have to nuke it. When the, whatever army comes in Medina, they establish a curfew, martial law, and that very first night, they vaporize with lasers the Kaaba, leave a hole in the ground. I don't know if you realize that means the devil has sent to pits of hell for a thousand years. And the Muslims will all have to convert to Christianity. I mean, I may sound crazy, but this is the way I see it. It can be done. The head of the snake can be cut off without killing millions of people, or billions of people. And you want to know something? The Muslims will then bless you as the Germans, after 1945, were blessed that the Allies banned Nazism. The German people could only have a life after Nazism was banned. The Muslims, who are good people, can only have a life after Islam is banned. And I'll just add one last thing because it's a very important religious message. I don't know if you remember the Six Day War. Yes. The Six Day War, Allah promised the Muslims that they were going to win. But Allah lied to the Muslims. <laughs> and I, how many people know what one of the names of Allah is? Al-Makr. How many people heard of Al-Makr? I talk about this in the churches. 
Al-Makr means the greatest of all the liars and deceivers. Allah, the God of Islam, is the greatest of all the liars and deceivers. Now, if you're a Christian, who's the greatest of all the liars and deceivers? Satan. Satan. But you see, in the Middle East, it is a virtue to lie. For a Jew and Christian, it is a commandment to tell the truth. For the Muslims, it's a commandment to lie. It's called taqiyya. Taqiyya is the exact ideology. Lying is permissible and commanded. So the Muslims said, you know what, all these years, all these centuries, we've been lied to by this Allah. And we should go over to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of truth. So what happened? How many people remember Moshe Dayan with the eye patch? So Moshe Dayan messed it all up. Moshe Dayan came with the keys to the Temple Mount, and he said to the Muslims, I'm returning the key to you. Let's make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Aren't we taught as Jews and Christians always to extend the olive branch? Magnanimous in victory? But with Islam, it doesn't work. And so the Muslims were saying, Aha! Allah even confused and deceived Moshe Dayan. We're going to stick with Allah. Because Allah is greater than the God of the Jews and the Christians. You understand the problem we're facing? It's a war between God and Satan. And so in my opinion, I think when the black stone is gone, and I've explained very, in very short terms, the Arab Spring will come to Saudi, the kingdom will be overthrown, the oils will be blown up, and then we're going to take Mecca and Medina because the one world government will command us to do it. And I don't believe that the Antichrist is President Obama. He's a salesman of the month, but he's not uh, the Antichrist. The Antichrist will come out of that system that imposes peace in one world government. Thank you very much. Thank you. And just a couple of quick things here. Uh, when Avi's talking about the threats in the United States and all, how many of you know who purchased the old uh, sportsman's club at 39th Street, yeah. just west of... Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was purchased by the Islamic Society of Oklahoma City, or, or one of the groups here, okay? How many of you know that that's not a part of the city limits of Oklahoma City? Did you know that was a little island there? Yeah. Yeah. Now, if they decide to put up the minarets with... Uh, but, you know, the 4.30 in the morning and five other times a day or whatever it is, who's going to stop them? I don't know. And I can tell you this, the Dove schools in Oklahoma City, in my opinion, are probably uh, Turkish uh, Gulan schools here. And um, Sally Kern had a, a bill this year to begin a process of trying to bring some transparency to these schools. And I'm partly to blame for this, but could not get a Senate sponsor for that bill. Now, here's my blame. Here's, my, here, here's the part that I'm in blame for this, is I, was, I asked the Senator to be the sponsor. By the time the Senator said no, it was too late to get someone else. I think we could have got someone else. But one of Sally's colleagues found out that she was not going to run this bill. If you don't have a Senate sponsor, your bill can't be heard. And found out she was not going to hear this bill and said, I'm so glad you're not going to do that. These people came in my office and they are almost in tears. They're such sweet, nice people. Yes. And they're big tech books too. Yeah. Do you, do you realize the deception mm -hmm. in the minds of so many of our state lawmakers right here in Oklahoma? Do you, do you folks understand that just you in this room today, if this is just the first time you've ever heard Avi, you probably understand more about the threat of radical Islam than I would say 85% of our state lawmakers. In fact, some of, the, some of the worst informed people in the state of Oklahoma are people that are elected to the state legislature. They're the best connected with lobbyists of any group of people in the state of Oklahoma. But as far as really being well educated, not the case. So anyway, folks, if you want tickets, I've got them. Please see me quickly. If you want to join Oak Platte, if you don't have your name on the sign-up sheet for the weekly email, please put it there. I need to get out of here as quickly as I can. So come get your tickets. And um, if you want to join up, please do so as quickly as you can.